Greetings. This is the lesson for uh, People of the Promise Divided Kingdom lesson number 24 uh, concerning the books of Nahum and Zephaniah. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, holy Heavenly Father, we uh, humbly come before you now, um, approaching you in this lesson concerning your judgment, the day of the Lord, and uh, your divine wrath. And these are topics we tend to steer away from, Heavenly Father, but we ask that you would now help us to understand your wrath, understand your intent and purposes behind it, uh, that we might rightly respond to it. We ask, Lord, that you would um, impress upon our hearts these truths and uh, help us to learn them um, in a way that uh, will gain traction in our lives and uh, make a difference. Heavenly Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me ask, have you ever experienced righteous anger? Righteous anger or wrath is not our normal mode of anger. Righteous anger is not selfish. It is not an emotion that cares uh, about others. Righteous anger does not seek to harm or to retaliate. So we wonder, how might we experience righteous anger? Well, a couple of examples. Have you ever heard of a person who vandalized a great work of art or uh, some aspect of nature? That could generate righteous anger. Or hearing that, uh, that a, a husband or a father ha had abused his wife or children, and you were outraged by that. These scenarios could generate righteous anger. Well, if we as flawed individuals can and do experience righteous anger from time to time, is it not reasonable that our Creator be angry over the injustices that He sees in our world. This seems reasonable to me, and yet many people are offended by the idea that God would be wrathful. The Bible tells us that God expresses wrath. I was telling our leaders this last weekend here that some people describe the God of the Old Testament as a God of wrath, but, but that's not true. Wrath is not an attribute. It is an emotion. God's wrath is an expression of his holy hatred for sin. His wrath flows from his intense desire to protect the people he loves from sin's harm. And because God's plan is for his righteousness and justice to prevail, he will act in the lives of all people, believers and unbelievers. So part of our problem is that we compare God's wrath with our anger. We, as human sinners, as human beings, we give anger a bad name because we often act inappropriately when we are angry. But not so with the Lord. His wrath is pure. It's measured. And he is fully justified in all that he does. This week we're studying two more minor prophets, Nahum, and Zephaniah, and God's wrath figures prominently in both their writings. Nahum prophesied God's judgment on the Assyrian Empire, focusing on its capital, Nineveh. The timing of his prophecy is between the year 663 and 612 BC. Zephaniah prophesied God's judgment on both Judah and its capital, Jerusalem, uh, but also on the nations of the world. Zephaniah probably prophesied around the same time as Nahum, maybe a little bit after. Both prophets reveal a God who is passionate to rescue his world from evil and violence. He expresses his wrath, which purifies, and his grace, which restores. And those are the two themes that run throughout these, pro uh, these prophecies, God's wrath and God's grace. So our goal this week is to understand that, God's, uh, extra, that God exercises purifying wrath against sin, but he also offers restorative grace to those who respond to him in repentance. So the outline is simple. 
two prophet, two two prophets, two two divisions. First, we're going to look at the wrath and judgment of Nineveh. That's Nahum's writings, and what we'll learn here: Nahum's name means comfort, and the comfort in his message will come from knowing that God's wrath is consistent with his grace. His wrath is intended to be redemptive, to drive us back to him. It is only punitive when we have failed repeatedly not to, resp to, to respond to him. And then we'll see wrath, judgment, and restoration of Judah. That's Zephaniah. And Zephaniah's name means the Lord hides. His remnant people will ultimately find shelter from his wrath in his son, Jesus Christ. So if you would open up your Bibles to Nahum chapter 1, and we'll get started. Nahum begins his prophecy with a description of God's divine character, especially as it pertains to his wrath. The Lord is a jealous God, that is, he is zealous to protect what belongs to him. When his name is profaned or his people are mistreated, he takes it personally. And because of that, he is, a, is an avenging God. And just so we don't gloss over it, Nahum provides emphasis, repeating this three times in verse 2. He says, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. Though he is vengeful, he is slow to anger. He withholds his judgment for a long time. That doesn't mean the Lord's weak. It means he is long-suffering and patient. Second Peter 3 tells us he desires that all people repent. The people of Nineveh, Nineveh belonged to God. He loved them, and that was why he sent Jonah a hundred years earlier. That generation responded and repented for a time, but wickedness ultimately reasserted itself. And there were likely other opportunities for the Assyrians to repent. They had multiple interactions with Israel and Judah over the years. They would have been exposed to the God of Israel during those times. I submit to you that the Lord is a God of many chances. He is patient and long-suffering to all. But for each of us, those chances will ultimately come to an end. Nahum was announcing the end for Nineveh. While God loves all his creation, the Lord does not leave the guilty unpunished. A just God must punish sin. Nahum says he is also great in power, and it is evident from his control over all nature. All creation cannot withstand the Lord. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. The mountains quake and the hills melt away. The earth trembles in his presence. Nahum asks, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? And the answer is no one can stand before the Lord when he is angered over our sins. Back in 2 Kings 18, King Sennacherib, uh, uh, his field commander stood before the men on Jerusalem's wall and he made this challenge. He said, who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord de deliver Jerusalem from my hand? That commander soon learned. And yet the Lord is good. In verse 8, he, he, we learn that he is a refuge in time of trouble. Wrathful against those who oppose him, good to those who trust him. Even though the Assyrians had been foiled in their attempt to take Jerusalem previously, they continued to plot against Judah. In verse 9, they were actually plotting against the Lord, and he was going to bring an end to them. Nineveh seemed mighty to Judah, and the Lord did use the Assyrians to discipline his people, but the Lord would afflict them no longer, at least not through the Assyrians. Despite all that Judah had done, God chose to pardon them. Did Judah deserve this? No. They 
were the one they they were the ones who had rejected God. So why did God do this? Because of his grace. God's grace is his unmerited favor. He gives uh, gives it even though we don't deserve it. Nahum concluded chapter 1 promising God's destruction of Nineveh. Uh, they may have been uh, there have many. There have been many great cities uh, that have fallen in times of war. Cities like Rome and Babylon, Paris and Berlin, in World War II. All these cities were rebuilt. They they existed for another day, but not Nineveh. Unlike these other cities, Nineveh's destruction would be complete. Within a couple of generations, it had all but disappeared. So much so that when Alexander the Great passed through that region. He didn't even know it was there. Never again would Nineveh invade Judah or any other nation. But how would that happen? Nahum wrote his prophecy shortly after the Assyrians had taken the great city Thebes in Egypt. Thebes, or at the time it was known as No Amon, fell in 663 BC. At that time, it was considered an impregnable city. Its destruction at the hands of the Assyrians sent shockwaves through the known world. And yet God inspired Nahum's words 50 years before it happened. Chapter 2 provides the specific details of God's judgment on his enemy. Historians consider chapters 2 and 3 to be among the best descriptions of an ancient city under siege, not only in detail but in tone. Chapter 1 is calm and dignified in its style. Chapter 2 is more tense and vivid. Nahum portrays the horror and savagery of ancient warfare. Reading it, you can't help but feel the sense of urgency from the defenders and ultimately their disbelief at when it falls. Nahum describes the development of the action, beginning with the enemy advancing on the city and the call to guard the fortress and marshal their strength. In ver chapter 2, verse 3, Nahum correctly described the colors of the adversaries. The Medes and the Babylonians wore scarlet attire. They carried red shields. They moved so quickly in their chariots, they seemed like lightning. They stormed the streets of the suburbs, leading to the fortress walls. Nineveh's defenders set up their protective shield, but, but even natural forces were against them. Nahum writes in chapter 2, verse 6, the river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. We're not sure exactly what happened. The, the Kosher River passed through the city, and, and it's known, historians know that King Sennacherib had previously dammed the river upstream to control its flow. And these historians theorize that the invaders closed the floodgates. When the reservoir was filled, they opened the gates and the resulting flood undermined the fortress walls and the palace collapsed. The ancient historian Diodorus Siculus wrote that heavy rains contributed to the problem. Nineveh's destiny was decreed by God. The Assyrians had conquered and exiled many people. Now they were going to be exiled and carried away as slaves. As the people fled before the invaders, they left behind their possessions. Nineveh had been known as the robber city. Its amazing wealth had come at the expense of the many nations that she had subjugated. All of it would be taken away. Verse 9, plunder the silver, plunder the gold. The supply is endless, the wealth from its treasures. She is pillaged, plundered, plundered and stripped. Hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble. Every face grows pale. The lion was the symbol of Nineveh. The Assyrian kings had likened their ferocity to that of lions. But now the prophet taunted them. Where now is the lion's den, he wrote. In a most chilling statement, the Lord declared to Nineveh, I am against you. In chapter 3, Nahum transitioned from the facts of God's judgment uh, to the reasons 
for his judgment. Nahum declared woe on Nineveh, for it was truly a city of blood, never without victims, he writes. The Assyrians earned that title by their many atrocious practices, cutting off hands, feet, ears, and noses, impaling captives alive, flaying victims alive and using their skin as wallpaper. By their own accounts, the Assyrians were barbaric. They would suffer the same brutal tactics that they had employed. Chapter 3, verse 3, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number. And the reason for this terror is that she had lusted for power like a prostitute. Nineveh's control over other nations was exercised by sorcery and witchcraft. Nahum's writings are dark and depressing. Strange for a man whose name means comfort. But he does provide comfort for those who heed the warnings that come from God's wrath. Nineveh is a picture of an unrepentant sinner. The Assyrian Empire was dominant for almost 500 years. It terrorized the known world, so much so that when they were ultimately defeated, the nations sought to erase any memory of them. But we need to remember them as an example of what happens when we go our own way. The details of Nahum's prophecy were fulfilled remarkably. Historians and archaeologists have confirmed many of Nahum's details. They give us great confidence in this little book, confidence in God's word and a reason to heed his warnings. God's warnings and examples of God's wrath are aspects of his grace and love. Any discipline short of hell is grace. What would be the final straw for Nineveh was another chance for Judah. God's purifying wrath seeks to turn people from their sins. But ultimately, if that fails, his wrath will be punitive. Our sin leads to God's wrath, but his wrath is first expressed in redemptive discipline. And so the principle that I submit to you is that God's wrath against sin is an expression of his purifying, protective love. Does God's wrath contradict his grace? No. God's wrath motivates his purifying efforts in this world. He is about purging everything that is evil and sinful, creating a people for himself. Those of us who reject his offer of redemption in Christ will find that ultimately God is against us. And that will be just as terrifying for us as it was for the Ninevites. Dr. John Hanna says that nations are without souls, so they are judged only in time, while people reside in time and eternity. God raises up nations for his purposes, often to confront the evil of other nations. And when those nations have accomplished their purposes, God, who has ordained them and preserved them to accomplish his will, allow them to do as they please and pursue their own wicked ways. Is this not playing itself out in our nation today? But when that happens, we will incur his justice. All nations will eventually disappear from the pages of time to become distant memories and lessons never to be learned. And so the question that I would pose is, how have you experienced God's purifying wrath? And, and what has been your response? And what has been my response? The lesson here is to heed God's wrath, understanding it is an expression of his purifying love. Now, let's talk about Zephaniah. This prophet is interesting right from his very introduction. Though the messenger is human, his message is from God and carries his authority. He states it right there in verse 1. As, and as far as his background goes, uh, we learn more about Zephaniah than most of the prophets because he's, he traces his lineage back four generations. Most prophets only trace back to their fathers. Zephaniah, son of Cushi, 
the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was a popular name. So that doesn't necessarily mean that Zephaniah was the great, great grandson of King Hezekiah. But many scholars do assume that he descended from royalty. Zephaniah's book contains two main themes. First of all, he declares the Lord's imminent wrath on Judah, implying their need for repentance. God's wrath in this case, not focused on unbelievers, but on those of who were considered themselves God's people. And then secondly, words of comfort that he provides. Even in judgment, God does not forget his covenantal people. He will restore his people at a future time. Zephaniah writes, uh, wastes no time uh, when God's judgment is involved. His key phrase here in this book is the day of the Lord. Beginning in verse 2, he says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. What he proclaims here is appears to be universal judgment, reminiscent of Noah's day. Judgment would extend to all the land animals, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. Having said that, though, Zephaniah will later reveal that a remnant would be preserved. And so this judgment is limited to the wicked. Having set forth this expansive judgment, Zephaniah then goes on to detail Judah's wickedness and how it will be destroyed. We wonder what exactly is going on here. Is this the universal final judgment that he's talking about or merely the destruction of Jerusalem that occurred in 586? The prophets, we must remember, tended to collapse their prophecies. Near-term fulfillments foreshadowing the farther off ultimate fulfillments. Likely they wrote thematically rather than chronologically. In any event, Zephaniah saw the destruction of Jerusalem ushering in God's day of wrath. In verse 4, he describes the imminent day of the Lord, where the object of his wrath was Judah. Zephaniah makes special mention of specific groups. Uh, there were the leaders of Judah. In verse 8, the officials. They had turned to idols and adopted values that pulled them away from God. There were the merchants, the retailers. Their corrupt business practices took advantage of others. And then there was the member of the, members of the public, verse 12, those who were complacent, who thought, uh, uh, who thought uh, the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Their, their complacence led them to dismiss God's wrath and ignore it. All this talk about sin and God's wrath had no impact on their lives. Like Nineveh, God's judgment on Judah would be horrific. Uh, you, 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 you would be able to see it. You would hear it. There would be the cry of bitterness, distress and anguish, trouble and ruin, darkness and gloom, clouds and blackness. Why? Verse 17 says, verse 17 says because they have sinned against the Lord and they couldn't save themselves. Verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Salvation is a gift from God by the grace of God. We cannot earn it. We cannot work for it. And no amount of money can buy it. And this situation foreshadowed God's future judgment. Verse 18 reports, The whole world will be consumed, for the Lord will make sudden end, a sudden end of all who live in the earth. Fortunately, there is more to the story, though. Just when we thought it was hopeless, Zephaniah points us to the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek, the righteous. seek righteousness, seek humility. For Judah, many people died in the Babylonian invasion, but some did seek the Lord and were spared. For us, we seek God where he and his righteousness can be found by looking to 
to Jesus Christ and humbly acknowledging our sins before him. The most compelling picture of God's wrath is the cross of Jesus Christ. It was there that Christ took the full brunt of God's wrath for us. By trusting in him, we avoid his wrath. But for many, that's a problem. We must humble ourselves. And we, we don't want to. At least many don't want to. We want to earn things ourselves. But salvation from God's wrath does not depend on our goodness or our accomplishments. It depends on what God has done through Christ. That can be comforting or discomforting. But even then, Zephaniah warns us in verse 3 that perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Why? Because God sees into our hearts. He knows whether we have been truly transformed by faith and repentance. We may be doing and saying all the right things outwardly, but God sees inwardly and he knows who truly are his own, those who will be sheltered from his wrath. Beginning in verse, chapter 2, verse 4, Zephaniah extends God's wrath beyond Judah. The nations listed there reflect the four points of the compass. Philistia in the west, Ammon and Moab in the east, Cush in the south, Assyria in the north. Together they symbolize the whole earth, for, the whole, for all of mankind is under God's wrath. In chapter 3, Zephaniah turns his attention back to Judah. We see two aspects of God's grace here. That is that he, he, by his grace, he has revealed his truth to us. And secondly, he, by his grace, he restores his re re remnant people. In verse 1, God's revelation of truth to Jerusalem was met with rejection. It was a city of repressors, obeying no one, accepting no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. The instructions of God and the corrections of God are to draw us back to him, to trust him. But this was not happening for the majority. And because the people of Judah rejected God, he would hold them accountable. In verse 5, it tells us, uh, Zephaniah tells us that God is righteous. He does no wrong. By his grace, he had chosen Israel out of all the peoples of the world. By his grace, he had revealed his truth to them. While he was responsible for their predicament, he was not to blame. They were. When the people of God reject God, they prove themselves to be no different from the nations, no different from the people of Nineveh. God holds every person in every nation accountable for the, the truth that he has revealed to us. And rejection of his truth has consequences. But for those who receive and trust in his truth, God receives them as his people. They will be the ones who will escape his judgment. And this is where Zephaniah ends his prophecy. He does so by taking us to the other side of his judgment, where he will restore his people. He will bring his scattered people home. They will call on his name and will no longer be shamed. They will be re reunited and purified. And Jesus, the Messiah King, will return to establish his kingdom on earth and reign among us. He appears, Zephaniah appears to point to a future larger gathering of God's people from Israel as well as the nations as a whole. They will gather in heavenly Jerusalem. And Zephaniah leaves no doubt about who is behind this regathering. Notice all the I wills. The God of grace is the God of the I will. I will purify, he says. I will remove. I will leave. I will rescue. I will gather. I will bring you home. God will restore his people and bring them home to him. He will do it. And so the final principle is that God expresses wrath against sin, but offers salvation to the repentant. We had that question in our lesson regarding balance. How do we balance God's promise to judge evil with the promise of the gospel? How can we find comfort in these two truths? Some think 
the two contradict one another. I don't think so. I think they complement one another. You see, the good news of Jesus Christ is only good considering the bad news of our sinful state. We need to realize both. In ancient times, nations would go to battle and armies often engage one another far from the cities. All the folks back home were anxious, worried to hear how their army fared in battle. And the news of the outcome of the battle would come from a runner who would advance before the troops. The Apostle Paul captures the image when he wrote, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We are hopeless without a savior. But Nahum and Zephaniah are just two of the latest of God's messengers bringing us the good news from the front. God has made a way for us through Jesus Christ. And so the question I have for you, how have you responded to the beautiful message of the gospel? God's wrath is a terrible thing to experience, but we who are in Christ do not have to do that. And with that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you have provided a way for us, that you have provided a way that we can avoid your righteous anger toward us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us again to impress upon us uh, the seriousness of our sins and that um, we need to be found in Christ. For any out there who have not done so, I pray, Lord, that uh, this message would be impressed upon them, that they too would run to Jesus for shelter. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake.